uh, organized uh, by the philosophy department at Duquesne. Um, with the assistance uh, and generous support of Dr. David Kale, uh, who is an alumnus of our uh, PhD program in philosophy. So we're very, very grateful to him for the idea and for the support. Um, the idea is really to showcase what we do as philosophers and to try and demonstrate the uh, sort of integral role and importance of philosophy uh, in, in a modern context. And uh, before I introduce the, uh, the first of our speakers, I wanted to uh, quickly um, outline the other talks that will be taking place over the course of the semester. Um, on Friday, October the 23rd, at noon, also in the Africa room, uh, myself, I'm Tom Ayres, I'm an assistant professor of philosophy at Duquesne. I'll be talking on the theme philosophy and art. Then on Friday, November the 13th, we're very lucky to have uh, Dr. Michael Har Harrington, also of philosophy at Duquesne, who will be addressing the theme philosophy East and West. And then uh, Friday, December the 4th, uh, we have an external speaker, Dr. Mark Anderson, of Belmont University, and he will be speaking on creativity and the philosophical life. And all of those will be at noon uh, in this room, in the Africa room. Um, uh, just quickly, I wanted to thank uh, Jeff uh, Lampert and Tyler Cunningham, who are our, our graduate assistants in philosophy, uh, who did quite a lot of the legwork in sort of getting publicity out there uh, and so on. So we're, we're very grateful to them for that. Uh, so it gives me great pleasure to introduce my friend and my colleague, uh, Dr. Patrick Miller. Uh, Dr. Miller is an associate professor uh, in philosophy here at Duquesne. Uh, he took his PhD in philosophy at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. Uh, he's the author of Becoming God, Pure Reason in Early Greek Philosophy, published with Continuum in 2011. He's the co-editor with CDC Reeve of uh, Introductory Readings in Ancient Greek and Roman philosophy, and the author of a slew of articles, and I just wanted to highlight one because I'm particularly fond of it, which is uh, Monstrous Maturity on Mulholland Drive, which is a very, very fascinating reading of the David Lynch film Mulholland Drive, which was published in a collection devoted to the film uh, in the Ravage series, uh, Philosophers uh, on Film, published in 2013. And Patrick is uh, going to be speaking to us today on the theme philosophy at the university, so please join me in welcoming Dr. Miller. So thank you to the committee for inviting me to speak. I'm flattered, and thank you to David Kale again for the support of this series. This is exactly the kind of talk I love to give, much more so than standard academic talks. So I got very excited and wrote too long a paper, and I apologize. A typical, well, the reading of this paper is 55 minutes. But it's broken into four sections, and you, you should feel free to leave at any time. This is it's supposed to be an informal gathering with lunches and so on. But I'm going to pause at the end of each section, and those would be sort of maybe the polite occasions to get up and leave. But I don't mind at any point. <laughs> so philosophy in the university. <clears throat> By, uh, in 1940, Father Raymond Kirk was still less than 40 years old himself when he was appointed president of Duquesne University. So you have to imagine the hasty judgment of a young man against the terrifying backdrop of a Europe divided between insatiable Nazis in the West and their Soviet allies in the East to understand what could have possessed him to begin his presidency as he did. At the beginning of the academic year, 1940 to 41, he issued to the faculty a pamphlet which threatened with discharge any professor even those with tenure who committed any of 16 discreditable acts. These were acts he prohibited them from doing in the classroom, needless to say, but neither would he tolerate them doing these acts in their private lives, however that might be discovered. Here they are, and I'm going to read all 16 because I think it's a fascinating list. Number one, to question the existence of a personal God. So if you question that in the classroom or in your own life, you get fired. Two, to maintain that religion had its origin in human ignorance. Three, to teach any proposition inconsistent with Catholic doctrine. Four, to question the testimony of personal consciousness as a criterion for objective certitude. And I take that to be a gesture towards the importance of phenomenology. Uh, number five, to question the duty of religion for all men. Six, to question creation as a volitional act of God. Seven, to question the immortality, spirituality, individuality of the human soul. Eight, to suggest the natural moral law is the result of mere custom or convenience. Nine, 
to question the physical freedom of the human will. 10, to question the immortality rights bestowed by the deity, commonly called natural rights. 11, to support any idea that fosters racial or religious or class hatred. 12, to deny that civil authority is derived from God. Or 13, to question the fact that civil authority is bound by moral law. 14, to foster materialistic communism or any other form of political theory that would destroy the American form of government. 15, to fail to realize that an inculcation of patriotism is a duty incumbent upon all members of Duquesne University faculty. 16, to cast aspersions on the adherence of any form of religious belief. Fortunately, I was hired after this pamphlet was issued. <laughs> because I have committed each of these discreditable acts, not only in my private life, but also in my classroom. And this is not because I am a discreditable person, though you may assume that I am, but because I am a philosopher. My job is, among other things, to raise questions, especially ones about God, the world, the soul, the self, freedom, politics, morality, science, and everything else that matters to human life. I was hired, in other words, to commit discreditable acts such as these ones every time I conduct a discussion with students. There's nothing special about me in this regard. My colleagues commit these same discreditable acts too. That's one reason why I like them so much and am so happy to work at Duquesne, a Catholic university where these questions are taken so seriously. Because I've been elsewhere at some of the most prestigious universities in the country where many of these questions are not seriously investigated. Officially, there, professors have freedom to think, teach, and write about whatever they wish, but they ignore some of the questions that have preoccupied me my whole life, which is more or less the list of those questions. Asking them at Duquesne will never be easy, nor should it be. I come not to bury the Catholic mission of our university, but to praise it, although that may not become clear until the end of my talk. For I begin with the problem philosophers seem to pose to this mission. Catholic Christianity is an Abrahamic religion. It thus demands faith and obedience. God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son, Isaac, and Abraham was about to do it before God relieved him of that horrible duty. Every Christian, like every Jew and Muslim, should be troubled by that story. Philosophers have, for millennia, been most vocal in expressing this trouble. Imagine God speaks to you and asks you to do something like that. Will you do it with the resolve of Abraham? Well, are you sure it was God speaking to you? Might it have been a hallucination? Could you be going insane? Even if you were of sound mind and the voice was really God's, are you sure you understood his meaning? Could he really have made such a demand? Isn't he good? Maybe he is testing you, but passing this test requires you to see that his goodness precludes such acts. Or maybe he means what he says but not literally, and so on. These are philosophical questions about God and us, but also about knowledge and sense perception, health and illness, good and evil, meaning and truth. By asking them and trying to answer them rationally, you would be taking the decision about what to do into your own hands. And yet, the Abrahamic God requires faith and obedience. This is high tension. But high tension need not be bad. In fact, it can be good. Consider the bow. Without the tension between its wood and its string, the arrow cannot fly. In fact, the arrow can fly farther as the tension of the bow grows higher, until, of course, it snaps. In speaking to you today about the tension between philosophy and the university, and particularly the Catholic university, I want to increase the tension without snapping the bow. To do so, I need to start with another tension, within philosophy departments themselves. For there is a tension between being a philosopher and a philosophy professor. The latter is someone paid by a university to consider the questions asked by other philosophers in her field. She surveys and evaluates some of the answers provided, she develops some answers in response to these, and she writes up the results for the evaluation of her peers. That's valuable work, and every day I marvel that I am paid to do it not least because fewer and fewer deserving people are so lucky nowadays. It's a shrinking profession for reasons I'll discuss later. For now, let me say I am grateful for it, but I don't consider it my vocation. Before my professional duties come my duties to philosophy.
not wisdom, mind you, but the love of wisdom. This love obliges me to organize my life around asking those discreditable questions and trying to discover the best answers to them. The goal of a philosopher, however, is not to publish those answers, although that, that's nice, but instead to put them into practice. To be a professor of philosophy is to do a certain kind of job. To be a philosopher is to live a certain kind of life. They overlap, but they're not the same, so there are tensions between them. I might succeed as a philosophy professor, for example, while ignoring certain injustices in the field or institution that affords me a living. Indeed, my professional sex success might require me to ignore these injustices. After all, I need the support of other professors to be promoted, and I work here ultimately at the pleasure of the president. Criticism of professors or administrators could harm my career. It certainly won't help. As it happens, I have tenure, which is supposed to protect my employment. But there have always been legal ways around that obstacle, and they are getting easier to use for reasons I'll also discuss later. At this moment, I want only to observe how succeeding as a professor, like succeeding in any job, requires obeying certain conventions, saying certain popular things and not saying others that are politically incorrect, regardless of what is true, doing some reputable things and not doing shameful others, regardless of what is just. Succeeding as a philosopher, by contrast, requires saying and doing unconventional things. It requires being willing to subject every assumption to doubt, critique, and occasionally scorn. In a world such as ours, people of conscience will always feel this tension between social prudence and their moral obligations. But philosophers have a special duty that makes this tension more acute. For we seek not just any truth. Our goal is to get to the bottom of things, to find the few big truths that underwrite the many smaller ones. We seek the kind of truth that inevitably threatens the established order, the dominant notions of justice, because these notions and this order establish their dominance over us by obscuring their origins. So that's the introduction, and now the second section. So please leave if uh, this is not what you were in for. <laughs> uh, you had your lunch, and it's time to go. That's fine with me. So this next section is called Plato's Cave. Socrates himself made this very clear, that is, this tension, both in word and deed. As Plato presents him, he never set out to humiliate or anger anyone, but those were inevitable results of his search for the most important truths. He believed that he had a vocation, a divine calling, to ask certain questions of himself and other Athenians, questions such as, what is true leadership, what is courage, or what is justice? Who better to answer such questions, he thought, than the people who step forward as experts on them, the political, military, and judicial leaders. So imagine getting an interview with the President of the United States on national television and asking him these questions. Now imagine that his very effort to give answers is met by you, politely but firmly, with decisive objections. You bring the President to a confused and humiliating silence. It is clear to everyone watching that he has no idea what justice is, or courage, or true leadership for that matter. And yet he was elected because he was supposed to know these very things. The interview is raw, as are the nerves of the man who has power over the justice system, the federal police, and the armed services. Now imagine that you do this not only with him, but with many powerful people in Washington. However sincere your efforts to discover the truth, however genuine your efforts to care for the souls of your countrymen by helping them to discover it too, they will move from confusion and humiliation to anger. This is roughly what happened in the late 5th century BC, as Socrates' interrogations made him too many powerful enemies. He led and examined life. He encouraged others to do the same. They executed him. Well, that's what this series is about. It's called The Examined Life, taking philosophy outside the philosophy department and showing how important it is to everyone for the betterment of us all. But if Plato is right, we should not be optimistic about this series. He conveyed this warning in his famous allegory of the cave. At the bottom of it sit prisoners who have been shackled their entire lives. Projected onto the wall in front of them are images of everything we free people see here above, chairs, lecterns, people, and so on. The prisoner's illusion is so comprehensive and persistent, though, that they never doubt its reality. It's all they've ever known. Consequently, they do not think, 
all of this might be an illusion and then convince themselves otherwise. No, their absorption in the illusion is so deep that the question of its reality never occurs to them. In this way, they are like small children listening to stories for whom the truth of the story is never an issue. Children's minds are open to stories in a way adults are not, which is why they are so easily influenced for good or ill. Good influence over children we call education, bad, corruption. Who are the projectors of these images in Plato's allegory? Who are the people responsible for keeping the prisoners in thrall to their illusion? Plato never says, and those who discuss Plato do not often say, but I think it is one of his sharpest lessons. They are symbols of the influence that some people have over others to construct for them a reality. These are educators in the broadest sense, encompassing influences both good and bad. First come parents who tell stories to children and build a world for them in many other ways. The movies they show, the toys they buy, the jokes they find funny, the actions that anger them, and so on. Soon afterwards come school teachers who continue the construction project of the parents, sometimes adding to it according to the parents' intentions, other times taking it in unexpected directions. Joining parents and school teachers as builders of the illusion known to everyone as reality are religious and political leaders, journalists and entertainers, psychotherapists and capitalists, anyone who projects lessons about the most important matters. What is life all about, otherwise known as its meaning? What is worth striving to achieve, otherwise known as the good? How should we treat one another, otherwise known as justice? And who are we really, otherwise known as the self? So they might eventually be philosophy professors, the people hired to ask questions about the meaning of life, goodness, justice, the self, and so on. The people, in other words, hired to perform Father Kirk's discreditable acts. But wait. In Plato's allegory, the projectors ensure the imprisonment of the viewers. They do not liberate them. On the contrary, they keep projecting images that keep the prisoners from recognizing that they are imprisoned. When the projectors succeed in their task, it never even occurs to the prisoners to rebel. Their images make the shackles unnecessary. Their images, indeed, are the true shackles. So these projectors are all corruptors. Who, then, is the true educator? In Plato's allegory, someone descends into the cave from above, from the real reality, where people are free, to loosen the shackles of one prisoner and show her that the images she formerly took to be real were only images. This liberator is the philosopher, or whatever you want to call the person who investigates what's really real as opposed to what merely seems so. How does the liberated prisoner react? At first, according to Plato, she will be confused. Her eyes must adjust, but more importantly, her mind must do the same. Formerly, it never occurred to her that the world was one way rather than another, for the question of the world and its nature never arose. The philosopher teacher, who forces her to think this way, who forces her to begin thinking, properly speaking, at all, will therefore induce confusion, then fear, and finally, anger or gratitude, depending on whether the liberated student has the courage to endure this struggle or not. Not everyone prefers freedom to the comfort of a familiar imprisonment. What will be the difference between the philosophy professor who cooperates in the imprisonment of her students on one hand and the philosopher who liberates them on the other? The mere professor uses his classroom to reproduce images. His students master the conventions around important matters, learning what to say and what not to say about them in order to secure the approval of others. His students become better able, in other words, to navigate the illusion of the cave, otherwise known as our culture. This is not to say being unconventional for the sake of scandal is education. Teaching Nietzsche or feminist theory, seasoned with a quirky mustache or tattoos, provides no more authentic an education than the bourgeois conformity or unthinking piety these postures scorn. And if you didn't notice the mustache, I also teach Nietzsche, so I'm mocking myself <laughs> as well. The philosopher uses her classroom to disrupt the status quo, yes, but not because she fetish fetishizes revolution. She wants her students to be free, yes, but recognizes that to achieve freedom, they must not only be turned away from illusions, but also toward reality. That's a tall order for a one semester course, believe me. Most often, within the limits of the American the best she can do is loosen the shackles a little bit. 
leaving students disoriented, afraid, and in many cases, angry. Socrates was condemned on two charges, corrupting the youth and impiety. The Athenians blamed him for the political turmoil of the late fifth century. They thought he had turned the rich young men away from the values of their fathers and had made them unreliable inheritors of their political and military legacies. To some extent, the Athenians were right. Socrates taught his students to care more for their souls than for their wealth or their political power. Some, such as Plato, were converted. Many, however, walked away from his interrogations confused, humiliated, and angry. What made the difference? In a word, character. To follow Socrates' reasoning, you must be patient, you must be disciplined, and you must be able to endure the confusion that ensues once you recognize your own ignorance. This is especially hard for anyone who holds power or a reputation for knowledge. Not surprisingly then, platonic education works best when we begin with children, forming in them the habits they will need in order to climb past the projectors and exit the cave. Only someone with the right character, with self-control, courage, and several other virtues, will be able to reach reality. There, in the world above, the liberated student sees the things whose images she saw below. After her eyes adjust fully, she is finally able to see the thing that not only makes everything visible, but also created it all. And in the allegory, that's the sun. Now, our astronomy is better than Plato's was, needless to say, but his analogy still holds well enough. So far as we know, our planet and everything on it is the product of the same explosion that continues in the center of the sun. In a sense, then, everything around us is its product. Additionally, everything visible is also ultimately visible because of its light. Therefore, if you want to understand anything here, first by seeing it, later by knowing its origins, you must become familiar with the sun. In any case, it's just an allegory. Beholding the sun with your own eyes, you can descend back into the cave, this time as a liberator or educator. If your students grow angry with you, as they usually will, it will help to remember the pain you also experienced while learning. Indeed, when your supervisors, let's say the administrators of your university, grow angry with you, whether because you are upsetting the sources of its revenue or because you are committing other discreditable acts, you should exercise the same mature equanimity that your own teacher once showed you. This is how you show them your gratitude. We all owe such a debt to Plato, who began the first university in the Western world, or at least the first one for which we have much evidence. He called it the Academy, after the name of the field he inherited outside the wall of Athens. It lasted several centuries with one long interruption until it was decisively closed, along with the other schools of pagan philosophy, by Justinian, who, not coincidentally, sought to consolidate the Catholic identity of the Roman Empire. We do not know the Academy's curriculum, but we must assume it was similar to the one Plato introduces with his cave allegory. After rigorous physical training, for the sake of self-control and courage, there is instruction in the arts, whose stories and music will inculcate from earliest youth the right attitudes to human life. Next, it includes a decade of mathematics for the study of the world's invisible structure. Then, five years of philosophical conversation aimed at discovering a defensible account of the good. What in the world is that? As it turns out, it is not in this visible world. The good is Plato's name for whatever turns out to be the goal of human life, whatever gives it meaning. He compares this supreme being to the sun. Whereas the sun seems to produce and make visible everything bodily, this is really the work of the good, which creates and makes intelligible both the visible and the invisible reality. Once students can explain this in words, that is to say the students of the academy or the ideal curriculum, Plato thinks they should take up political posts for 15 years often overlooked in teaching of Plato that at once they can have a conversation about the good and give a defense of it, they're not supposed to then rule. They're supposed to go down and occupy minor political posts. And why is that? Only so will they see how the good, thus explained in words, manifests itself in deeds amidst the complications of human life. Only then, sometime after 50 years old, when they have achieved that grand vision of the good and its effects in the visible world, do they earn the title philosopher? Obviously, this is not a curriculum for today's university, although I think it still makes a pretty good recipe for the formation of its philosophers. However that may be, 
it at least gives a distinct idea of what a university is, as well as philosophy's role in the university thus conceived. So let's elicit its features that are relevant to us. First of all, it assumes that there is one reality, and that education's purpose is to bring students into direct acquaintance with that one reality, so far as this is possible. This first feature is therefore an assumption of truth with a capital T. Secondly, it assumes that this one reality, this truth, is created or sustained by a supreme being that is good. Plato calls this, as we've seen, the good. But without much distortion, we may follow centuries of religious interpretation and call it God. Third, philosophers, the ones that it educates, to know this truth and this God can only reach this spiritual height by coordinate training in character. Intellect alone is insufficient because, as we have seen, someone of weak character will receive education as a threat rather than as a gift. Finally, the early inculcation in values and training by habit will be complemented in maturity by service to the community, where the rationale of the early habits will at last become clear. To summarize, Plato's model of a university involves an assumption of truth, a belief in God, a formation of character, and a prescription of service. That's the end of the second section, so those who want to leave, by all means do. Okay, I'll begin the uh, third. This one's called University and Epistemology. Catholic universities, and above all Duquesne, exhibit all four of the features I just summarized in one way or another. This makes them different in nature from their secular rivals. Let's quickly survey how this is so, using Duquesne as our example, beginning with the obvious differences before moving on to the subtler ones. First of all, our mission statement enjoins us as faculty to serve God by serving students. This is an ancient notion rooted in the earliest religious orders who consecrated everyday labor with the recognition that the world is God's, so that laboring well within it is a form of worship. Evidently, this motto would never work at a secular institution, nor would a second, which advertises Duquesne as education for the heart, mind, and spirit. Secular institutions not only refuse to credit the existence of a spirit, let alone the Holy Spirit, but also rarely offer themselves as places where one will receive more than intellectual training. If they do insinuate a training for the heart, the character traits they aspire to inculcate are never so specific and coherent as those of Christianity, with its ancient reflection on the cardinal and theological virtues. That's because secular institutions are the product of the Enlightenment, an 18th century intellectual movement that defined itself largely against the church. Medieval Catholic universities, such as the University of Paris in the 13th century when St. Thomas Aquinas was lecturing, they assumed that the virtues of character were necessary for the achievement of intellectual virtue, so that students had to arrive with a certain sort of character, then received additional formation during their studies. It wasn't enough to read ancient texts and master their arguments, as we do even now, but students and faculty then, if they were to reach the heights of knowledge, had to participate in the liturgical life of the university, respecting its ecclesiastical authorities, going to confession, and so on. This was education for the heart and spirit, as well as the mind, with the assumption that knowing certain truth requires faith and feeling. This ancient model of knowledge, this epistemology, was the main target of modern philosophers, exemplified by David Hume, who submitted his character and intellect to no religious right or authority and openly mocked both. Dare to know, wrote Immanuel Kant, have the courage to use your own reason. In his short essay promoting the values of the Enlightenment, he argued, like other thinkers of his era, that knowledge was best sought outside the moral and spiritual supervision of the church. Many prestigious secular American universities were founded at this time or soon after, and they thus exemplify this modern approach to knowledge. The first of them, UNC, which as was mentioned is where I got my graduate degrees, is responsible to no authority except one, the people of North Carolina and their representatives. Nowhere does its mission statement mention the formation of character, let alone service to God, nor could it as a university in the Enlightenment tradition. A university, any kind, is an institution for the advancement and propagation of knowledge. Consequently, its epistemology, what it thinks knowledge is, will determine its whole structure. Its epistemology is its DNA. Like other universities with mostly Enlightenment DNA, 
UNC cannot coherently propose either a personal God as its goal or an education for the heart and spirit as a way of reaching him. At a Catholic university, by contrast, everything is supposed to stem from that same service, just as every service is supposed to aim toward that same being. Many nowadays fear this unity of the Catholic mission as a threat to diversity. Vigilant against such threats, secular universities are becoming ever more thorough in their efforts to celebrate diversity, as the motto goes. Faculty in the University of California system, for instance, were recently presented with a list of microaggressions that should be avoided in order not to offend some in their diverse student body. On the list of offensive statements were, America is a land of opportunity, and I believe the most qualified person should get the job, because non-white students might experience these statements as insinuations that they are inferior. Also deemed threatening are many of the texts taught in our core courses, replete as they are with the racism and sexism of earlier times. In order to protect diverse students from being re-traumatized by these and other offenses, faculty at some institutions are supposed to put trigger warnings on their syllabi and assignments. Students at Columbia recently called them to uh, put trigger warnings in front of Ovid's Metamorphoses because of its depictions of rape. Many professors fear this political movement as hostile to freedom of thought, discussion, and thus education. So long as students' evaluations have played a role in our professional success, there have always been pressures for us to coddle them. Inflated grades are only one symptom of these pressures. The handbook of my college describes a grade of C as average, and yet when it became clear to me in my first semester that students felt entitled to at least a B for mediocre work, I spoke with my dean, not the current, but several deans ago, who showed me the actual distribution of grades in all college courses. 45% were Bs and 35% were As. Put another way, 80% of Duquesne students are above average, just like the children of Lake Wobegon, or for that matter, most other American universities. A teacher in such circumstances, writes Plato, is afraid of his students and flatters them. Recall his cave and imagine the SES scores of Socrates, the liberating teacher whose instruction requires inducing fear and anger. Like most political movements, the current one for greater diversity of students and thus greater sensitivity toward their feelings has its origins in philosophy, whether its proponents recognize this or not. In this case, I believe the source was France, where a group of philosophers popularly known as postmodern gained prominence in 1968 and then influence in American universities during the following decades. Michel Foucault, for instance, wrote histories revealing modern beliefs, lifestyles, and institutions to be the products of power struggles now forgotten. In this way, what modern people have taken to be the natural order of things, he showed to be no more legitimate than the many alternatives it defeated in a struggle for supremacy. No, no more legitimate, that is, unless might makes right, and the accidents of history can grant truth to power. Another important figure in this movement was Jacques Derrida, who read canonical texts of the Western tradition and showed how they fall apart under close scrutiny. Deconstruction is the technical term now used for this method, and it has armed a generation of professors, already critical of the Western tradition for its racism and sexism, with a technique for showing every text to be a struggle for power, even within itself. Foucault and Derrida are taught at Duquesne, and should be, as should Hume and Kant, but so far neither microaggression nor trigger warning has come into the dialect of our campus. But remember, this is where you want to be when the world ends, because everything happens here 10 years later. <laughs> Meanwhile, a battle is raging in the secular university between those on the one hand who favor its modern understanding, according to which truth is still the goal, albeit apart from religious conceptions of truth, and those on the other hand who favor its postmodern understanding, according to which truth is always a disguise for power, no less when it is sought by scholars as when it is regulated by priests. I believe that both sides will lose this battle, as I, as I shall explain, because their internal quarrel is distracting them from the larger external forces attacking the university, sapping the energy they will need to meet this attack and win. So that's the end of the, uh, I guess that's the third section, and I'll pause before the fourth.
Okay, this fourth section is called Democracy and Oligarchy. To see what I mean, let's return to the notion of diversity. There are all sorts of diversity, not just the racial, sexual, and class diversity that the professoriate usually discusses, but also diversity of religion, political opinion, and character formation, which they rarely mention and sometimes openly reject. Whatever is meant by diversity, though, the rationale for celebrating it at secular universities goes something like this. There is no authoritative hierarchy of lives and worldviews, so that a university's task is to study as many as possible, even to welcome them all within limits, so that its students have many options from which to choose whatever suits them best. Correlatively, when it comes to majors, the university's task is not to rank some above others, the way that Plato ranked philosophy above mathematics and the arts, or the way the medieval University of Paris ranked theology above philosophy. Instead, the secular universities try to support all departments equally, bending only to concerns of money and prestige, but especially money. If students lose interest in anthropology, for example, while flocking to advertising studies, then administrators at these universities will move resources from the former to the latter, unless perhaps anthropology gives their school a national reputation for academic excellence. And why not? The state universities are there to serve the needs of their citizens, after all, so that if their citizens want to study business communications rather than classical languages, who are the administrators to say that the latter are of greater importance to a true education than the former? Deliberately or not, then, this model imagines the university as a supermarket of livelihoods, lifestyles, and beliefs. The metaphor is Plato's to describe democratic culture, which values freedom and equality, diversity, and tolerance. What he says of the typical citizen of a democratic culture could easily be said of us. And this is a fairly long quote. And so he lives from day to day, gratifying the appetite of the moment. Sometimes he drinks heavily while listening to music, while at others he drinks only water and is on a diet. Sometimes he goes in for physical training, while there are others when he is idle and neglects everything. This is what's important. Sometimes he spends his, uh, his time engaged in what he takes to be philosophy, and blah, 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 it goes on. The list of fickle preoccupations continues, but I'll interrupt it there with what he takes to be philosophy in order to suggest that of all the types that surround us now, Plato is best describing the American college student. At many American universities, Catholic and secular alike, students must study a little philosophy. Some enjoy it, and a few go on to major in it. But for most, it's an obstacle on the road to another major. There are so many to choose from, after all, and the others appear to offer more lucrative careers. To enter this supermarket, prospective students must, of course, uh, must of course first pay the price of admission, tuition, almost always with the help of parents, increasingly supplemented by federal loans. But once here, as savvy customers, they will shop for the best value. But what is value? What, in other words, is the good? That's a philosophical question. For Plato, as we've seen, it's the ultimate one. Without the help of philosophical training, then, people typically assume a notion of value from their culture. This is how values are transmitted to prisoners in the cave. So what are the values of our culture that students assimilate without scrutiny? Well, look at the most popular majors. By far now, this is business. In the last 40 years, in fact, the proportion of students seeking majors in business and the health sciences has nearly doubled while the proportion of those seeking majors in English and education has declined sharply. The question about value has been answered by whichever major seems the quickest route to a lucrative job. Along the way, if students must take core courses that invite them to experiment with lifestyles or at least worldviews, we should not be surprised if their criterion is the same. Majors are chosen consciously for market reasons. Worldviews, beliefs, and lifestyles likewise, only unconsciously. Nor should we be surprised to see this happening to American universities, for they are all, to a greater or lesser extent, microcosms of the society they inhabit. Ours is explicitly a democratic culture, as nearly every image conspires to remind us. From children's books to popular television shows, we are always hearing about the natural equality and freedom of all people, however unequal and unfree they find themselves because of their circumstances. Even advertisements trumpet a superficial diversity, while most politicians preach the importance of tolerance. This is less so, of course. If this is not obvious to you, study a truly foreign culture. I recommend the ancient Greeks. And you will notice that these themes almost never occur. And when they do, it is almost always for derision. 
In Homer's Iliad, for example, a common soldier named Thersites tries to speak at a war council, and he's beaten to general laughter. In later accounts, moreover, he is forever tortured in Hades for his insubordination. It's not that he spoke out of turn, it's that he spoke at all. Only noblemen have the right to speak, which it would be unjust for any commoner to assume. We, for our part, have Mr. Smith goes to Washington. When you don't notice the democratic ideology being projected before you, you can't criticize it. But once you do, it is not hard to begin. Last year, a study out of Princeton and Northwestern made a splash by proving that the United States, for all its democratic pretenses, is in fact an oligarchy. Quoting, economic elites and organized groups representing business interests have substantial independent impacts on US government policy said the study, while average citizens and mass-based interest groups have little or no independent influence. In other words, the rich rule. Rulers of every kind, whether rich or tyrannical, promote their rule by propagating ideology to justify their rule. The rich not only bust labor unions accordingly, but project images that presume justice to be the freedom necessary to amass large quantities of wealth, which oligarchs themselves have confused with the good. By images, thanks to Plato's cave, we mean movies, campaigns, and stories, both fictional and true. Ayn Rand's Atlas Shrugged appears on screen. The Koch brothers inject a billion dollars into the current election cycle. And the most popular Republican candidate is a businessman with no political credentials. Yet other democratic values do persist. Equality, diversity, and tolerance are important to many people, so that even those who despise them must appear otherwise. The biggest threats to oligarchic rule, I believe, are therefore the people most able to expose this hypocrisy, the hypocrisy between the oligarchic reality and the democratic illusion. These are the philosophers. No surprise, then, that the most aggressive oligarchic politicians, for example, the governor of Wisconsin, now running for president, are attacking universities by limiting their funding and eliminating tenure. I just heard on the radio yesterday that he uh, has taken $250 million out of the University of Wisconsin budget and then at the same time made a $250 million grant to build a stadium for the Green Bay Packers. For it is tenure that allows professors to speak truth to power without fear. It is tenure, in other words, that encourages professors to be philosophers. There were no professors in Plato's era, but there were oligarchs. And everything he says of them and their rule is being fulfilled in our own times. Of all these prophecies, here is the one that speaks most directly to us in the American University. Quote, since the rulers rule in it because they own a lot, I suppose they are not willing to enact laws to prevent young people who have become intemperate from spending and wasting their wealth. That's how they get richer. Credit card corporations who bombard young people with irresistible offers of easy money thereby stand accused but at least one can default on their loans fairly easily. By filing for bankruptcy, that is. Not so with student loans. And I told you you actually can file for bankruptcy on student loans, but it's extremely difficult to, uh, to uh, have the judge settle in your favor. So these uh, student loans for which it's very hard to file for bankruptcy, they create a kind of indentured servitude. Seven out of 10 seniors now graduate with an average of $30,000 in debt. Why? The American university has come to function willy-nilly as a gatekeeper of the American middle class. Without a bachelor's degree and increasingly a master's, it is quite difficult to get a decent job. Yet tuition just keeps going up, much faster than inflation, wages, and the cost of living. At public universities, it has tripled since 1980. Why? In my view, it's a perfect storm of oligarchy and democracy. Administrations keep growing at 10 times the rate of faculty positions, to be precise, in the last 25 years, hiring administrators with ever more Byzantine titles. As with the American corporation, whose values and buzzwords they imitate, the pay for this managerial class has swollen, more than doubling since the Reagan Revolution. So it is easy to complain about them. But when people make this complaint, whether it's faculty and staff, whose wages have stagnated, students and their parents, who must pay the bill, or alumni and donors whose contributions are necessary to make up the shortfall, if any of these people are making that complaint about administrators, they need also to look in the mirror because the administrators are just giving us what we want. 
For nearly every new office the administration creates, there is a contingent of employees or customers who want it. Don't like that we've hired a Title IX officer to investigate cases of ambiguous sexual conduct that could instead be handled by the police? Well, plenty of faculty and parents of female students are happy about that. Don't like that we've hired an officer responsible for making our campus more diverse when this is supposed to be a fair country already? Well, plenty of faculty and parents of non-white students are happy about that. How about the basketball and football coaches who pull in ten times the salary of starting professors for giving us amateur versions of the NBA and NFL? Imagine the outrage among students and alumni if the president decided to return our sports to a truly amateur status and focus more on teaching and learning. Luxurious dorms, a gym to rival the best in town, and study abroad programs that take students to the four corners of the world. What we've got here is no longer a university, at least in Pla as Plato conceived it, but instead a little society, a bubble for youth making the final transition to adulthood. That's why we're duplicating many of the services and costs of American society. Apparently, this is what we want. If so, we need to acknowledge the consequences not just in encouraging student debt, but also in exploiting adjunct labor. Nationally, about two-thirds of professors are adjuncts, temps, effectively, who have no job security, no benefits, and little chance of promotion. A third of them live at or below the poverty line. Duquesne has become notorious for this problem, first because of the dramatic death of one of our adjuncts two years ago, secondly because the administration has rejected efforts for them to unionize. Even if Duquesne's tuition is reasonable, when compared with alternatives, and we advertise ourselves as such, it's still much higher than it was 40 years ago. $34,000 a year for a student of the liberal arts. It was $2,000 for me to go to college uh, in my time. Now that's in Canada, it's a different system, but at any rate, it's unimaginable, $34,000. And even if the adjunct problem were less bad here than at other schools, who deserve more notoriety in my view, it's still a scandal here. If we're not comfortable with those consequences, among others, in our oligarchic age, then we need not only to complain about administrative bloat and greed, but also think hard about the sort of university we want to become. I have argued for the Platonic model and the Catholic mission that exemplifies it in our times. So that's the end of the penultimate section. I have one more that's going to take me about six or seven minutes. So if you want to go now, still short of the hour, but I think I'll finish up before one. This section is uh, called Duquesne's Mission. One problem I raised for this Catholic mission at Duquesne is the threat many fear it poses to diversity. I think that's a real danger, which is one reason I began this talk with Father Kirk's 16 discreditable acts. Had he enforced his severe rules, there would have been no intellectual diversity on this campus. Duquesne would have been no university, but instead a fancy Sunday school. His mistake, however, was not that he understood the mission strictly, but that he misunderstood it. What he showed with his pamphlet was that he was afraid of God's world. As I said at the beginning, who wasn't afraid of the world in 1940? Besides, his presidency turned out to be a good one. No one was ever discharged for discreditable acts, and during the difficult years of World War II, he worked heroically to keep the university viable. In fact, he died of lung disease the year after it ended at the age of 46, perhaps because of his devotion to Duquesne. Were it not for him, we, not, we might not be here right now. So there is diversity on this campus, at least comparatively. Some say too little, perhaps others will say too much, but it is enough to educate students about all the questions mentioned in his pamphlet. Some of these students have received a Catholic formation of their character. Many have not. That's fine. So long as this remains a Catholic university, and particularly a Spiritan one, there will always be a general concern for character as well as intellect. There will always be a concern for service to the community as well as academic excellence. And there will always be a general concern to see how everything relates to the God who created and sustains the world we study in our separate schools and departments. And I'm not saying every individual has to do that, but that there's a culture in which that's taken seriously and enough people are doing it to give it that culture. So long as we remain true to that Catholic mission, particularly its spirit and version, we can never as an institution accept wealth as the highest value of human life. We cannot therefore surrender to the oligarchic pressures that are genuinely threatening other American universities. This is why the administration's refusal to negotiate with the United Steelworkers, whom the adjunct professors of McAnulty College have chosen as their representative, is disturbing. The president has argued that doing so would threaten the religious freedom of the university, 
by inhibiting its freedom to choose professors who respect its Catholic mission. That argument falters, however, on the fact that before this dispute arose, adjuncts were rarely, if ever, scrutinized for their attitude to the mission. The administration's lawyers acknowledged this fact in their court brief, and I read it all, but they dismissed its relevance. Quote, it proves nothing, they said in a footnote, other than Duquesne's approach to achieving its clear and public goal of hiring for mission has not achieved 100% effectiveness. That is, of course, an understatement, because they were never able to produce a witness who was ever interviewed about uh, mission. As such, it reveals a structural problem with a university that aims to pursue a coherent mission for justice through cheap temporary labor. Adjuncts teach 44% of the core courses at Duquesne. It doesn't take a financial wizard to consider roughly what granting benefits to these workers and doubling their pay will cost the university. So we face a crossroads. One path preserves our university in its current form while compromising the mission. The other preserves the mission but forces us to disrupt our current constitution. That disruption is going to come sooner or later. So why not do it now with a principled choice rather than with grudging necessity later? Public universities are undergoing something much worse right now. When the state legislature of North Carolina puts pressure on its flagship university, as I said, the oldest in the nation, to produce, oldest public that is, puts pressure on that institution to produce more students capable of contributing to the economy of the state by teaching more business and STEM courses, for example, and fewer in the humanities and social sciences, the professors there are justifiably afraid of the outcome. By the way, half an hour before I came to give this talk, I just read an article somebody posted on Facebook that Japan's government has just issued a statement that uh, their universities have to cut their humanities and social pr uh, science programs. Seventeen of them are going to go along with it. So, seventeen universities that had humanities and social science programs, they're just gone. So, this is a world phenomenon. I'm not saying it's unique to the United States. So to what can those professors in North Carolina, or for that matter in Japan, appeal if they try to argue that there is more to education than uh, economic opportunity? The truth should also be sought for its own sake because it's good. Many of them believe that. Many of the professors at the University of North Carolina believe that. Many of the professors at secular institutions believe that. It's nothing unique to Catholic schools. And they show their dedication to truth by giving their whole life to pursuing it in their specialties, by publishing articles and books vetted by their peers for accuracy. The successful professors have published dozens, even hundreds of such articles and books. Those who have published less win less prestige, fewer grants, and less power in their fields. In this subtle way, without noticing it, most professors, despite their dedication to truth, have thereby cooperated in the commodification of their craft. The hallmark of a successful philosophy professor nowadays is not her wisdom, but her CV, where the products of her little factory are meticulously advertised. In yearly reports, she advertises her products to her administrative bosses, who then advertise these products and other like them to their underwriters. That is to say, parents, alumni, donors, legislators, and especially ranking agencies who know nothing about what we do. Professors dedicated to the Enlightenment ideal that the truth sets us free are becoming ever more alienated workers in a giant factory that ultimately enriches the few. Professors dedicated instead to the postmodern critique of truth make very potent criticisms of this perverse and elusive machine. Their critique stems from the ancient sophists, I believe, whom Plato depicts in his dialogues. Thrasymachus, for example, argued that justice is the advantage of the stronger by which he meant that moral and political ideologies are simply ways for the powerful to exploit the weak. Complementing this ethical relativism was the total relativism of Protagoras, who wrote, man is the measure of all things. This meant that every reality and truth is but the construction of humans. There is no reality or truth independent of how things appear to us. In terms of the cave allegory, it would be as if the cave were all there were. Some people project images for the manipulation of others while those others absorb these images as if they were real. But there is no exit from this theater of illusion and manipulation. There are only winners and losers in a perpetual contest over money and power. Plato aimed incisive objections against these sophists. They presented the picture of human life hypocritically, as if it itself were the truth. And they did so not because they really believed it, it seems, or for that matter really disbelieved it, but only because it helped them to make money. Their indifference to truth applied even to the truth of their own teachings. 
Appearing as experts in persuasive speech, they traveled throughout the Greek world, peddling the skill, becoming rich and famous. They were illusionists, magicians with words, the sort of people who nowadays become advertisers, campaign managers, or professors. For the postmodern approach to truth is an updated version of sophistry. As such, it should be taught and taken seriously at a Catholic university, above all because it's God's world, and this is an important part of the story. But this approach also has important lessons to teach everybody. There will always be narratives and theories that cloak themselves in the language of truth, even divine mission, in order to promote the interests of the rich and powerful. Much of modern philosophy is like this, coding colonialism and misogyny with a veneer of universal rationality. Here and now, if the rhetoric of truth and mission are being deployed to suppress legitimate doubts about the images projected by oligarchs in order to imprison our minds, then a critique of their so-called truth and mission will be an important first step in our collective liberation. Foucault and Derrida are very helpful for anyone making that first step, but in my view, we cannot go any further with them because they reject the notion of a real justice, a true goodness, the right meaning, or authentic selfhood. According to their approach, there can be no education in the platonic sense, only the deconstruction of one illusion after another. Call it education of another sort, but private donors, as well as state legislators, have lost patience with it. People outside the university want to know what we offer, and they grow understandably afraid, humiliated, and angry if all we ever do is undermine their fundamental beliefs and cherished institutions. That's why we, in a Catholic university that reproduces the main features of Plato's education, can save the university itself, not just our own, but secular, as well as religious, public, and private. The threats to us are real and most insidious when they present themselves disguised as Catholicism. But we, at least at an, as an institution, if not also as individuals, know what we are offering. Liberation from illusion, yes, but only as a first step whose summit is an encounter with the real good. Isn't that what everyone wants, something really good? People may grow afraid, humiliated, or angry on the way to that, but everyone seems to want to get there one way or another. We may not know what that is or how to get there, but recognizing our ignorance is the first step in our education, and this is the invitation to philosophy.